On August 25th, 1170, the Norman Lord Strongbow exhaled a sigh of relief as the walls of Waterford collapsed. His army had been repelled twice in their attempt to take the city, but they had finally breached the fortifications and as his troops poured in, everyone knew the tide of battle had turned in Strongbow's favour. There was still hard fighting ahead, but as the hours passed, the defenders realised their position was hopeless. Eventually, they would yield the city, but Strongbow was in no mood for mercy. Having captured the two men who had commanded the defence of Waterford, he ordered their immediate execution. Then, in a somewhat surprising turn of events, Strongbow, a man who had stormed the city only hours earlier, set about preparing for his wedding. Indeed, before the sun set, his bride-to-be, the 17-year-old Aoife McMurrah, had made her way inside the ruined city. Stepping over the bodies of the slain, she would marry Strongbow in the city that day. That their wedding was celebrated amidst such carnage was a portent of what the marriage would lead to. In the following decade, Ireland would witness unprecedented violence and warfare. Indeed, the wedding of Aoife McMurrah and Strongbow had changed the course of Irish history permanently. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dwyer. Today's episode is a dramatic story and one I really love. It takes us back to the Norman invasion of Ireland and in particular the marriage that underpinned the entire saga. The show is also going to hone in on Aoife McMurra herself, who she was and the role she played in the invasion because she's certainly a far more complex figure than is often thought. Now before we begin this fascinating story, just to remind you that part four of my exclusive series on the Troubles drops on Patreon this week. This looks at the years 1970 and 1971, a pivotal and dramatic time in the early stages of the conflict as gun battles between Republicans and the British Army began to break out across the North. This will drop on patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast and Acast Plus this Thursday. If you're not a supporter of the show and you like the sound of this series, it's really easy to become a supporter and get access today at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. I have a link to that in the show notes below. Finally, if you have any questions, comments or feedback about this show or recent episodes, just send them in. I'm going to start a new monthly feedback episode where I can answer all your questions or include your feedback. You can reach me at info at irishhistorypodcast.ie. Sound is by Kate Dunley. As Aoife McMurrah travelled through the city of Waterford on the way to her wedding to the Norman Lord Strongbow, she was hardly surprised that her marriage was taking place on the battlefield. Although she was only 17 years of age, this wedding had been years in the planning, and it was always likely that it would end up taking place on a battlefield of one kind or another. Aoife had been born into royal dynasties on both sides of her family. Her mother, Moore, was from the O'Toole's, a powerful family in North Leinster, and her uncle on that side of the family was Lorcan O'Toole, the Archbishop of Dublin and one of the most powerful clerics in Ireland at the time. Meanwhile, her father, Dermot McMurrah, was King of Leinster, a kingdom that stretched from Dublin to Wexford at the time. And while these connections afforded Aoife a privileged upbringing, life had always been unstable. In her youth, the McMurroughs had enjoyed rising power and influence. Her father, Dermot, a man of boundless ambition, had proven himself a canny operator in the ruthless power politics of the age. By forging an alliance, with the most powerful man of the time, the High King Murkathoch McLaughlin, Dermot secured a powerful benefactor who supported his rule in the Kingdom of Leinster. However, Aoife McMurrah's life had been transformed by events in 1166, when her father's luck had finally run out. His ally, the High King McLaughlin, had been killed in battle and Dermot McMurrah's enemies realised his weakness. Isolated, and with few friends or allies, 
by the end of that fateful year, Dermot McMurrah's fall had been staggering. Forced to go into exile, he, along with Aoife and a few dozen supporters, had left Ireland. As their ship slipped out of Wexford Harbour, this left Aoife with no idea where life would take her or if she would ever return to Ireland. Crossing the sea to Britain, the McMurrahs had made their way to the court of King Henry II, the most powerful man in northwestern Europe at the time, hoping he might lend Dermot military aid to reinstate him to power in Leinster. However, any hopes Aoife may have had that this would lead to a quick return home were very soon dashed. In 1166, Henry had other priorities and the prospect of getting entangled in Irish politics didn't interest the man. He did, however, grant Dermot McMurrah permission to approach his vassals in England and Wales to enlist their support. However, even to these men, McMurrah struggled to make an enticing offer. He had little to pay potential mercenaries other than vague promises of what he would grant them if he did manage to regain power back in Ireland. Indeed, the only tangible thing Dermot had in 1166 was Aoife, his daughter. And although she was only 13 years of age at the time, this didn't stop her father offering her hand in marriage to copper fasten any deal that would attract mercenaries to his cause. Now this wasn't enough for most of the lords he met in England and Wales, who one after another rejected his proposals. That was until they met with Richard de Clare, a Norman lord better known to history by the sobriquet Strongbow. This was not actually a name he used at the time, but probably a later corruption of Strigol, the massive fortification and seat of the de Clare family, situated on cliffs over the River Wye at modern-day Chepstow. However, in 1166, Dermot McMurrah found in Strongbow a man who shared similar experiences in life. The Norman lord was also a man of boundless ambition, but he too was politically marginalised by the 1160s. Two decades earlier, Strongbow had backed King Stephen against Queen Maud in a civil war in England. The war had ended with Maud's son, Henry II, taking power in the 1150s, and he never forgave Strongbow's disloyalty to his mother. In retaliation, he had stripped the magnate of his ancestral title, Earl of Pembroke, and left Strongbow in a political wilderness. So when the McMurrahs opened the door for a military campaign in Ireland, this immediately piqued his interest. In the winter of 1166 to 1167, he thrashed out a deal with Dermot McMurrah that would see Strongbow come to Ireland with an army to reinstate Dermot as King of Leinster. This agreement would transform Aoife McMurrah's life. Dermot also offered the Norman lands in Ireland and to cement their deal, Aoife's hand in marriage, which would open major possibilities for the Norman lord in Ireland. Now, as I mentioned, Aoife was only 13 years of age in 1166, but the marriage would have seemed abstract to her at this point. It was still years away, and both sides had a lot of work to do before any wedding would take place. For Strongbow to fulfil his end of the deal and land an army in Ireland, he would need to secure the permission of his own king, Henry II, and as we have seen, relations there were fraught to say the least. Meanwhile, the McMurrahs, father and daughter, would have to return to Ireland, lay the groundwork for Strongbow's arrival, and stay alive and at liberty as well. Given the nature of their departure from Ireland in 1166, they certainly couldn't expect a reception committee when they returned. It was 1167 when the Irish exiles left Britain and returned to Ireland, accompanied by a small number of Norman warriors. Dermot McMurrah did re-establish control over his own dynasty, sidelining his brother Murchad, but overall his successes were limited. Indeed, this was probably to Dermot's benefit. His bitter enemy, Rory O'Connor, had become High King, but Dermot's limited impact left O'Connor satisfied that he was actually a spent force. Oblivious to the agreement he had made with Strongbow, he didn't force McMurrah back into exile. Two more years would pass before larger numbers of Norman warriors arrived in Ireland in 1169, and while their interventions were more substantial, 
their actions were still limited to internal squabbles in McMurray's kingdom of Leinster. They did take control of the port of Wexford, but the High King, Rory O'Connor, still remained largely unconcerned by these events and considered it an internal issue within Leinster. He did demand that McMurray hand over his son Connor, that's Aoife's brother, as a hostage to ensure his father's good behaviour. While Rory O'Connor viewed this as a guarantee that McMurray would act in good faith into the future, Dermot was merely buying time until Strongbow arrived. His son, however, was as good as dead because when that Norman army landed in Ireland and revealed the McMurray's hand, Rory O'Connor would be furious. Now, while this was all playing out in Ireland through 1169, across the Irish Sea, Strongbow remained committed to the agreement he had made two years earlier. He secured permission from Henry II and preparations were finally completed by the late summer of 1170. By August of that year, he was ready to set sail with a large army for the time consisting of 200 knights and a 1,000 foot soldiers. However, after what had been years of preparation, the plans were thrown into chaos at the last minute when Henry II, the King of England, intervened and ordered Strongbow not to embark on this military intervention in Ireland. Now, this left Strongbow with a major decision. He could proceed and incur the wrath of Henry or shelve his plans and return to a life in a political wilderness. Strongbow chose the former course of action and gave orders to weigh anchor and set sail, regardless of King Henry's orders. As his fleet left Milford Haven in Wales, Strongbow knew he had crossed the Rubicon. When Henry II heard what had happened, he stripped Strongbow of his lands and titles in England and Wales. Strongbow now had no future, bar the one he would create in Ireland. Having crossed the Irish Sea, Strongbow's army berthed in Waterford Harbour, 11 kilometres from the city. They were able to disembark unopposed and they met with the small Norman forces already in Ireland since 1169 on August 24th. After this, with little or no preparation, they launched their attack on the city of Waterford. Now Waterford was a somewhat unusual city in 1170 insofar as it was triangular in shape and extremely difficult to attack. Of the three sides, the north facing walls were protected by the river shore meaning they were almost impossible to assault. The lands to the west of the city were marshy and swampy, leaving the walls to the east the only place the Normans could focus their attack. However, this allowed the defenders to concentrate all their forces along this stretch of the walls. Twice the Normans would launch assaults on this section of Waterford's defences, and twice they were driven back. Although unsuccessful, these attacks were not entirely futile. While they had failed to breach the walls on both occasions, one of the Norman commanders, Raymond Le Gros, observed a weakness in Waterford's fortifications. This took the form of an unusual structure built into the walls, but supported by a large wooden beam outside the defences. In a third assault, the Norman army focused their efforts on this weakness and while they began to attack all along the wall, one group made their way towards this beam and hacked away at it. When this eventually gave way, the building it supported not only collapsed, but an entire section of the wall came down as well. Immediately, the Norman army poured through the breach, and the dynamic of the battle instantly changed. As we heard at the beginning of the episode, the Normans forced their way in, and intense fighting broke out in the streets. Now it's worth bearing in mind that this was playing out in a city that was no larger than eight soccer pitches in 1170. One source would claim 700 citizens were killed as the Normans seized control of Waterford. While these dramatic events were impressive, Strongbow could not rest on his laurels after capturing Waterford. He knew once news of this assault spread, The High King, Rory O'Connor, would inevitably raise an army and march to face the invaders. In light of this, the Normans were determined to march north and seize the city of Dublin before O'Connor could bring his might to bear on the situation. However, before he did this, Strongbow demanded that the McMurroughs first deliver on their end of the bargain, 
And to this end, he was insistent that he would marry Aoife McMurrah before he marched on Dublin. This wedding took place in Waterford in late August 1170 and would have enormous ramifications, as we will see. Now, in terms of the actual ceremony itself, it was probably a lot less elaborate than we might expect, and certainly less so than modern weddings. Aoife did not wear white. This tradition only stretches back to the 19th century. Strongbow, for his part, would not have worn chainmail. Medieval armour was extremely uncomfortable and wouldn't have been worn unless necessary. For us, looking back from the vantage point of the 21st century, surely the age gap between the two is the most unsettling part of the entire affair. Aoife was only 17, while Strongbow was in his early 40s. However, to contemporaries in 1170, this aspect of the union would hardly have raised eyebrows or shocked them. People certainly wouldn't have considered the age gap immoral or of questionable legality. The legal age for a girl to marry was 12 at the time. Nevertheless, there is evidence that the women, or rather girls in these situations, viewed their husbands as far too old and belonging to another generation. One medieval song gave voice to this in the lyrics. Alas, how can I sing? My pleasure is all gone. How can I live with that old man and keep my lover the sweetest of all things? In 1170, if Aoife McMurrah harboured such sentiments, they were never anything more than a secondary concern for her family at least. The idea of what seems to us of her being effectively traded to cement a military alliance would have appeared as entirely normal for the time. Love, it was believed, would or might come in time, but it wasn't a prerequisite for the marriage. And in the case of Aoife and Strongbow, the reality was there were major obstacles to them ever falling in love. The age difference aside, they didn't share a common language to speak to each other and came from very different societies, leaving them with very different expectations of what the marriage would bring. For example, even the lead up to the wedding was different. In Gaelic society, powerful families like the McMurras often engaged in what was called trial marriage, where a couple would live together before they would actually marry. While Aoife and Strongbow obviously had no time for such a trial, this was not something the Norman would have done in any case. In Gaelic traditions, a marriage often involved what was called a bride price as well. This was a payment by the groom to the bride's family. If the marriage broke down due to his actions, the bride could then expect to receive this payment. And this, again, was not something the Normans practiced either. However, while the relationship between the two was not the primary concern in 1170, it's very clear the marriage itself was very important. It's sometimes dismissed as secondary to the wider events we're about to discuss. But it's very clear that Strongbow saw it as being essential and central to his plans. The very fact it took place scarcely before the blood of the defenders of Wardford had been washed from the streets demonstrated the importance he placed on the Union. This is because the marriage was to a certain extent the glue holding together a much wider agreement between the McMurras and Strongbow. It certainly provided a degree of legitimacy for Strongbow's presence in Ireland But what remains unclear right up to the present is what precisely Dermot McMurrah had offered Strongbow apart from just the hand of his daughter in marriage. One thing for certain is that Strongbow didn't undertake the risks of invading Ireland, ignore a direct order from his own king and in the process lose his estates in England and Wales just to marry a 17-year-old who was the daughter of a man with a very uncertain future. This marriage must also have brought power and wealth to Strongbow. So next, we're going to look at what exactly Dermot McMurrah had promised this Norman lord as part of this marriage, because this is what would alter Irish history. When Strongbow took the decision to leave Wales and defy the orders of his king Henry II, a man with a legendary temper, he clearly must have had incentives for taking this course of action. No record of the agreement he had forged with Dermot McMurrah has survived, but people have speculated as to what it contained. Some have argued that Strongbow was offered control of the towns of Dublin, Waterford and Wexford. This seems highly probable, and they were among the first things the Normans secured control over after their arrival in Ireland. 
Marrying Aoife would undoubtedly have helped in terms of securing Dublin as well, the most important of the three settlements, because her maternal uncle, Lorcan O'Toole, was the Archbishop of the city, and his support would undoubtedly help legitimise Strongbow's rule in the city. However, I find it difficult to believe that these three towns would, in themselves, have been enough to incentivise the Normans to leave their homelands. A much more likely theory is that they were part of a wider deal, and history tends to support this. Most historians believe that Dermot agreed that Strongbow would succeed him in some fashion or another when he died. However, the two men may have had very different interpretations as to what this actually meant. In Gaelic Ireland, succession was an extremely messy and violent business. It was not simply a system whereby a son succeeded a father. No matter what Dermot promised to Strongbow, multiple members of the McMurra family, basically any male whose grandfather had been king, had a legitimate claim. This included not only Aoife McMurra's brothers, but also multiple cousins and uncles as well. While this almost guaranteed Strongbow, regardless of his marriage to Aoife, would face opposition, it also meant that Strongbow's heirs would not necessarily succeed him. Now, if that was the Gaelic-Irish perspective on it, Strongbow, raised in a Norman society, understood succession and these matters very differently. He would have thought if he succeeded Dermot as ruler of Leinster, and perhaps dominated the McMurra family through his wife Aoife, his son or daughter would be his rightful heir, and no one else could have contested this. Of course, it's very possible both sides did understand these differences, and Strongbow, for his part, just wanted to get his foot in the door, while the McMurras may well have thought they were playing the long game. If this was the case, they had no idea the dangerous man they were dealing with in Strongbow. He had no interest or respect for Gaelic customs. If he managed to succeed Dermot McMurra, he and his army would ensure it would never be taken away from him. However, in the aftermath of the wedding of Strongbow and Aoife in 1170, it was in everyone's interests to avoid pointing out the problems and contradictions in their plan. Both sides, Strongbow's Normans and the McMurras, had their backs against the wall and it was very questionable if any of them would live to see how all this played out. Already, some of the most powerful forces in Northern Europe, from Rory O'Connor, the High King of Ireland, to Henry II, the King of England, were determined to stop them. Indeed, while medieval weddings would normally be followed by feasting, there was no time for prolonged celebrations in Waterford in 1170. Hard fighting lay ahead, and the next step was to take the city of Dublin, before the High King, Rory O'Connor, could respond. So immediately after the marriage, the army, now comprising of Dermot McMurray's Gaelic Irish followers and Strongbow's army, left Waterford and marched on Dublin. Where Aoife herself went at this point is unclear. We can only assume she did not accompany the army into the field. She may well have returned to her ancestral home of Ferns in North Wexford. She certainly didn't travel to Strongbow's home in Wales given Henry II had taken this from him. Meanwhile, wider events, however, took an alarming twist for the McMurras. Even though Strongbow had left Waterford rapidly, the High King, Rory O'Connor, had moved faster and reached Dublin before him. To secure Dublin, Rory built a fortified line to the west of the city, where the road passed through a forest. While a major and decisive encounter loomed on the horizon, the fighting in later 1170 was somewhat anticlimactic. Strongbow and Dermot managed to outmaneuver Rory by marching through the Wicklow Mountains and arriving down behind his defensive position. Rory was left with little option but to withdraw, leaving Dublin to face siege alone. The city fell rapidly, but its autumn 1170 closed in. It was clear the real fighting lay ahead in 1171. However, Rory O'Connor would demonstrate his intent in this situation. Later, in 1170, he executed Dermot McMurray's son, Connor, who he had taken as a hostage and pledge of his father's good behaviour. This was merely a foretaste of what lay ahead. The opening months of 1171 were dominated by preparations for inevitable military campaigns that would take place in the summer. However, these were overtaken by events in May of that year. 
Dermot McMurrah, the architect of all these plans, took ill and died suddenly. Whatever agreement he had made with Strongbow, one can only imagine he never thought it would come into effect so quickly. This now pushed the issue of succession to the fore. Immediately, as was to be expected, several contenders emerged. Strongbow seems to have thought he was the natural heir, but Dermot's brother, Murkud, emerged as the leading figure within the McMurrah family. While this created chaos in Leinster, the High King of Ireland, Roy O'Connor, saw his opportunity and prepared to march now on the Normans in Dublin. The situation facing Strongbow was desperate. Indeed, even before O'Connor appeared on the scene, they would have to deal with an unexpected assault when they awoke one morning to find Dublin Bay full of Viking warships. This was an army raised by the Norse rulers of the city who Strongbow had deposed the previous year when he had taken Dublin. While they disembarked, the Normans had to prepare for battle. In a fierce encounter fought to the east of Dublin, Strongbow's army did carry the day, routing the Viking force. But this was merely the prelude to a major confrontation on the horizon. In the west of Ireland, Roy O'Connor was on the move at the head of a large army and he now descended on Dublin. He posed a far greater threat than any Viking army. Outnumbering Strongbow, his strategy was simple. Rory was going to starve the Normans out rather than try and assault the walls of Dublin. As that summer wore on, the situation facing Strongbow inside Dublin grew increasingly dire. As starvation set in, the garrison in Wexford was overthrown and taken captive as the entire Norman position across Ireland crumbled. The gamble they had taken seemed to be failing. Eventually, negotiations for the surrender of Dublin opened and Rory O'Connor was pretty generous in the terms he was prepared to offer. He was going to allow the Normans retain control of Dublin, Waterford and Wexford, but no more. In what is the best indication of Strongbow's intentions and plans in Ireland, he would reject this offer, despite the fact his army was starving inside the walls of Dublin. Instead, in a last gasp of move, the Normans flung open the gates of the city and launched a surprise assault on O'Connor. Catching the High King off guard, Roy O'Connor was supposedly swimming in the Liffey at the time, the Normans routed the Gaelic Irish force outside the walls. However, history itself seemed determined to defeat Strongbow at this point in the late summer of 1171. No sooner had he defeated Rory O'Connor than deeply alarming news reached him from Britain. Henry II, the King of England, had grown increasingly suspicious about events in Ireland and was, at that very moment, mobilising a massive army in Wales and preparing to come to Ireland himself. It appears that the King was concerned that Strongbow planned to create his own independent and potentially rival Norman kingdom in Ireland. While Strongbow had managed to win two major battles that summer, there was no hope he could best Henry II. In southern Wales, his army was preparing for war. Each day more vassals arrived in Henry's camp, building a formidable force. Meanwhile, through September 1171, royal carpenters were busy building prefabricated siege engines that were then taken apart and loaded onto ships for rapid assembly once they reached Ireland. Desperate, Strongbow rushed to Wales to try and somehow stop this war he could not win. Granted an audience with his king, the two men came to an agreement. Strongbow managed to convince Henry he had no designs on an independent kingdom in Ireland and recognised Henry as his overlord and king. However, although no Gaelic Irish person was present, they were the big losers. In October 1171, Henry II, now accompanied by Strongbow, crossed to Ireland with a vast army numbering some 4,000 men. No one, Norman or Gaelic Irish, attempted to resist such a host. But now, the unintentional consequences of Dermot McMurray's alliance with Strongbow emerged. Henry II would claim lordship over all of Ireland and anointed Strongbow as Lord of Leinster. He also parcelled out other kingdoms in Ireland to Norman lords. In the space of just four years, from talks beginning with Dermot McMurray's appeals for support to reinstate him as King of Leinster, the situation had evolved into a full-scale invasion. 
When Henry II would leave in 1172, there was still hard fighting ahead. For Strongbow, he could claim he was Lord of Leinster, but he had to make good on that, and they were two different things. His first priority was dealing with his in-laws, that's Aoife MacMurrah's family. Her uncle, Murchad MacMurrah, was King of Leinster, which made him a rival of Strongbow, who claimed the title Lord of Leinster. Now, Strongbow's natural instincts were probably to hunt Murchad down and execute him, but wiser counsel prevailed. Such a move would only have provoked a general revolt. So instead, the Normans deepened their alliance with the MacMurrahs. Murchad was recognised as king of the MacMurrah family, and he in turn recognised Strongbow as his overlord. Strongbow also pledged that the MacMurrah family lands would not be taken or invaded by Normans. And to cement this agreement, Murchad married a member of the Norman de Barry family. Other Gaelic Irish families were not so lucky, and the Normans began a wholesale conquest of much of Leinster. Now, from this point on, Aoife MacMurrah herself is largely ignored by the historical record. However, from the fragmentary evidence that survives, she seems to have played a far more and increasingly important role than once thought. She must have spent limited amounts of time with her new husband, given he would spend long stretches of their marriage on campaign either in Ireland or overseas. She did, however, have two children, a boy, Gilbert, in 1173, and a girl, Isabel, who was born before 1176. When she moved to Wales is unclear, but she would spend most of her adult life there, living in the enormous fortification of Chepstow Castle, carved into the cliffs above the River Wye. She would, however, remain the most influential member of the MacMurrah family, an outcome that was inconceivable at her birth. The last of her brothers who played an active role in these events, Donal, and her uncle Murchad, were both dead by 1175. Then, they were followed to the grave the following year by her husband, Strongbow. Traditionally, young widows like Aoife, who was incredibly still only 23, would be married off by the king to another noble. This was usually so this noble would rule over the vast estates that Aoife had inherited. These included not only her native Leinster, but also Strongbow's estates in England and Wales. However, Aoife would remain single for the rest of her life and remained an active player in politics. In the 1180s, Henry II paid her a stipend for the defence of Chepstow Castle, which was in danger of falling to a Welsh revolt. While she was referred to as the Irish Countess in royal records, a document in the 1180s indicates how Aoife saw herself as her father's heir when she signed a legal contract as Countess Aoife, heir of King Diarmid. Through the chaos of the 1170s, she had emerged as an incredibly important figure, not only in the emerging Norman colony of Ireland, but she also saw herself as the legitimate heir of her father. From a MacMurrah family point of view, her influence and power was beneficial, as the family was spared the wholesale destruction visited on many other Gaelic Irish families as the Norman invasion of Ireland gained pace through the 1170s and 1180s. There's no question that while Aoife had been cast an unenviable lot in her marriage to Strongbow at 17, by her 30s she had used this hand incredibly effectively. However, after 1189, her ability to influence the world around her did begin to decline. Her son Gilbert had died as a teenager and her daughter Isabel married William Marshall, a move which passed control of the vast de Clare family estates into his hands. When Aoife herself died is unknown. Towards the end of her life, we can only wonder how she understood and saw the events she had lived through and become such a key player in shaping. On one level, you can imagine she felt regret. If she lived into the early 13th century, she would have been alive to witness the Norman invasion penetrate the far west of Ireland and see the wholesale destruction of Gaelic society. However, Aoife, as someone who grew up in the 12th century, where the concept of Irish nationalism didn't exist and one's identity was inextricably bound up in her family, would probably have seen things very differently. When she was 13 years of age, she had fled her home in Ireland with her father and a few dozen followers. It had, at that point, seemed her family had been defeated and were forced into a life of exile. 
Three decades later, her daughter, Isabel, was heir to an enormous estate that straddled the Irish Sea and inherited, as Aoife undoubtedly saw it, her father's title as ruler of Leinster. Whatever Aoife's view, there's no question though the legacy for wider Irish history of these events was profound. One can argue that an invasion from the increasingly powerful and aggressive Angevin Empire emerging in England was inevitable. However, the actions of Dermot MacMurrah is what sparked that invasion. In 1170, Irish history unquestionably took a sharp turn in a new direction, one where colonisation and conquest not only shaped our history, but over the following centuries, an Irish identity that would emerge. Now that's where I'm going to leave the story. I'll be back next week with a show looking at the history of photography. And then after that, I have a really special episode. It's an interview with Dr. Eileen Murphy, and we'll be talking about groundbreaking new evidence on what daily life in the Middle Ages was like, based on analysis of a graveyard. It's a fascinating show that definitely changed my perception of what life was like in medieval Ireland. If you haven't done so already, don't forget to subscribe to the show to get that episode. Until then, Sloan. <laughs>